Good morning, everyone. This is Blue Mosque from Istanbul. And uh, my presentation is titled as Diversity Management at the, at, at the Age of Open Civilization, a Call to Multiplexity. This is a beautiful, beautiful calligraphy also from one of the mosques in Istanbul. And I will address five questions and try to answer them uh, briefly. First, I will ask why do conflicts occur? Is it possible to prevent conflicts before occurring and how? What's the difference between diversity management and conflict resolution? Why do we need an effective diversity management system today more than ever? How can we learn from the Islamic and Ottoman heritage of diversity management? Um, in my opinion, the most pressing problem of our time is diversity management because there are many conflicts occurring around the world uh, as a result of the uh, bad diversity management or lack of uh, diversity uh, management. And when I mean by diversity management is governing diversity of ideas, beliefs, interests, innate and inherited qualities by accommodating them. And uh, I also argue that we live in an era which I like to call open civilization. By this, I mean that uh, at the local level, we have multi-civilizational society in which members of different civilizations get together to make up a society. So this group here is a multi-civilizational society. It's an example of open civilization. And Today, we no longer have homogeneous societies as we used to have in the past. So this uh, makes it important for us to recognize that we have a new social uh, structure of uh, diversity. And at the global level, all civilizations are interconnected to each other, but not only the ones which neighbor uh, each other. But in the past, only the civilizations which neighbored each other, they had connections uh, with each other. But today, they are all connected to each other, and they influence and get influenced from other civilizations. So I say that civilizations today, they have no walls, no doors, no windows. And so my uh, most important question about why do conflicts occur? My argument for this is that Conflicts occur for one of the two reasons. First, the ideological or uh, religious illusion that it's possible to eliminate diversity and make all people the same. So this, this is the most important cause of uh, conflicts. And the second one, even when diversity is accepted, uh, then it should be managed e effectively if it's not managed effectively, then uh, conflicts occur. And by arguing this, I am refusing the argument that conflicts come from diversity, and diversity is a threat to social unity and stability. So I am, I am refusing this argument. Uh, and uh, is it possible to eliminate social diversity? There are two answers to this question. One, say yes, and these are authoritarian extremists. They think that diversity is a threat to social unity and national uh, identity, so it should be uh, eliminated. And, and those who say no, they are people who uh, believe in pluralism, that diversity leads to prosperity and power instead of conflict and division, and also history shows us that humanity, humanity had always uh, had uh, diversity. There has never been a single civilization uh, dominating the whole world. Humanity always had multiple civilizations, multiple religions, multiple uh, races, ethnic uh, groups. Uh, and also religion, in particular uh, Islam, says that diversity is God's will and uh, creation. Let me cite one verse from the Quran supporting uh, this view. Uh, the Quran says, uh, to each of you, we prescribe a law and a method. Had Allah willed, he would have made you one nation, 
united in religion, but he intended to test you in what he has given you. So raise to all that's good, to Allah is your return altogether, and he will then inform you concerning that over which you used to defer. So this verse shows that uh, this is it, diversity, it's God's will, uh, and it's not possible to eliminate it. So this is a calligraphy uh, showing interconnectedness of the universe. And uh, how to prevent conflicts before uh, occurring? Uh, so my argument is that if we can manage diversity, which is the cause of conflicts, then we can prevent conflicts uh, before uh, occurring. And there are two approaches today to conflicts. One is the conflict resolution studies. It's an academic discipline. And diversity management, I am trying to make it a new discipline uh, regarding uh, conflict uh, prevention. So conflict resolution is a passive uh, approach to conflicts. It waits until the conflict occurs, then intervenes to uh, solve the problem. And it's backward looking uh, and it's remedial, trying to heal the problem after it takes uh, place. And as an alternative to this, uh, my approach, uh, which I call diversity management, it's proactive, so intervenes before uh, the conflict uh, occurs, and uh, forward-looking, preventive. Um, why is it uh, uh, is an effective diversity management system more important than ever today? Because, as I mentioned, diversity is an essential feature of human societies throughout all uh, centuries. Uh, but today, it is more important for us to have an effective diversity management system because today, diversity is increasing, civilizations are getting intertwined, and as a result of this, uh, a new condition for humanity emerged which I call open uh, civilization. Globally, uh, the structure of the network of relations among civilizations uh, have, has changed because they, are, they all got interconnected with each other in a very close uh, manner. Second, locally, we have today all societies uh, as multi-civilizational uh, societies. So because of this, both at the global and local level, we need a very effective diversity management system. Otherwise, uh, this poses a, a, a source of uh, major conflicts at the global and uh, local level. And today, we observe many examples and outcomes uh, of this. And uh, how to manage diversity uh, today? My argument is that a multiplex worldview is the best way of managing uh, diversity. Today, we have two views on diversity, one I call briefly multiplicity, that society is characterized by uh, multiplicity. This is a postmodern approach. It emphasizes horizontalness uh, of uh, social relations, uh, and uh, it generalizes relativism uh, as a way to prevent uh, conflict. And the other approach which I uh, advocate, I briefly uh, name it multiplexity, it is traditional. Uh, it includes both vertical and horizontal uh, relations. And uh, it gives space to relativism, but without generalizing it. Uh, so there are things that are relative, but there is also absolute truth, and they have uh, their uh, places. And uh, it, inc thus it includes multiplicity at each uh, level. And uh, this multiplex view, I derive it from uh, Islamic uh, heritage. In, the, uh, in uh, traditional Islam, uh, uh, the existence, the knowledge, the methodology, and the meaning, and the truth has been accepted to have multiple uh, levels, which I call multiplex ontology. That existence had visible world, invisible world, and the divine world. So there are three major levels of existence. At each level, should be analyzed in a different uh, way using a 
a, a corresponding epistemology for each level of uh, existence. So uh, reason, sense perception, and reported knowledge uh, are accepted to be the sources of knowledge. Having these uh, different uh, views uh, incorporated together in one inclusive worldview allows accommodating both rationalist and empiricist, both materialist and idealist in the same uh, paradigm. And uh, corresponding to this multiplex ontology and epistemology, there, uh, there is a multiplex methodology incorporating rational, empirical, and mystic uh, methods. Uh, and the same thing at the, uh, uh, if, uh, in the field of hermeneutics, there are different uh, levels of meaning, external meaning, internal meaning, and the meaning of meaning. So let me explain what's meant by meaning of meaning a little bit. Let's say you knock the door and someone from inside says there is no one inside. What's the meaning of this? So if you look at the meaning, you don't understand. You have to look at the meaning of the meaning, which means I don't want you to come in. <laughs> so that's the meaning of uh, meaning. So this theory was developed by Abdul Qahir Jurjani. Uh, uh, 10th century uh, uh, scholar of uh, rhetorics. Uh, and also, uh, the truth is multiplex. There isn't a single truth. There are many levels of uh, truth. Truth uh, varies at each level of existence and uh, knowledge. So this approach allows accommodating different views regarding ontology, epistemology, methodology, meaning, and uh, truth. And uh, also, at the level of normative system, law and morality, uh, the traditional Islamic view had a multiplex normative system. Uh, the primary and the general level is the law, which is based on reciprocity and retaliation. And then another level, which is called tariqa, uh, uh, it is known as Sufism, is based on forgiving, not reciprocity forgiving and sharing and uh, sacrificing. And uh, a higher level of morality and normativity is uh, called hakika. Uh, it is based not on reciprocity, not on forgiving, but doing good to those who do evil to you. So it's a multiplex uh, normativity. And, uh, and this uh, multiplex normative system uses a multi-valued normative logic Usually, in the uh, legal and ethical thinking, dual logic is used, which is based on right and wrong. But the Islamic uh, normative thinking is not based on dual logic. It's not based on simply right and wrong. So there is absolute wrong, and there is absolute right, and there are things in between. Right to a certain extent, wrong to a certain extent. Not every right and wrong is the same. Like killing somebody is not the same as lying or insulting. So there are different levels of right and uh, wrong. Uh, so it is based on a multi-valued uh, logic. Here. And uh, uh, also, the purpose of law is defined at three levels. That law uh, should aim providing uh, necessities uh, for life. This is uh, universal human rights and they should be provided for everyone. And uh, uh, another at another level, law should provide legal rights for each uh, group based on uh, their needs. And also, at another level, there are moral rights which are not enforced legally, but enforced uh, religiously. And uh, as a consequence of this conceptual, uh, philosophical, uh, legal, and moral system, it was possible for the Muslims uh, to uh, accommodate different uh, schools of philosophy, different schools of theology, different schools of law, and different mystic schools in their own uh, society. And the same way, they could also accommodate non-Muslim communities, which is called millet uh, system. And Milla means a religious uh, community. It is well known that uh, Muslims accommodate Christians and Jews uh, in their uh, system, but less known that they also include uh, non-Ehli uh, uh, Kitab, 
uh, non-Christian, non-Jewish people also. And a good example of this, the Muslim rule in India, where Muslims uh, incorporated Hindus and Buddhists in their system and granted them the same rights they granted to Christians and Jews in the Middle East, uh, Indonesia, uh, and in the Ottoman uh, Empire, which shows the universality of uh, Islamic law. But in 19th century, what happened is that uh, Muslims, because of the westernization and modernization and colonizations, abandoned this Islamic diversity management system and adopted nation state system, which brought about conflicts, uh, religious conflicts, ethnic conflicts in the Middle East and in the uh, Balkan uh, region. And in my conclusion, I would like to uh, say that Today, the most important problem we have is the diversity management uh, problem all over the world, in America, in Europe, in Middle East, in Balkans, everywhere. And the best way of managing diversity and preventing conflicts before occurring is through a multiplex worldview, a multiplex normative uh, system. And if we need a practical example of this, we may learn from the Islamic and Ottoman uh, experience. Thank you very much.